to talk this morning about new beginnings. I know you might think, well, isn't that kind of a thing that you do the first Sunday in January as the year starts? Well, this is kind of that. There are a lot of things in the life of a church. We, we kind of follow the school calendar, we call it. September, the end of summer, it's back to the grind, if you will, back to school. It's, it's, it kind of feels like a new start. It's, it's almost like a, a January 1 in, in some ways. I realize a new school year doesn't impact all of us, perhaps not even most of us, um, as I look out over those of us gathered here this morning. Um, but, but when we stop and think about it, the idea of new beginnings is, is, is all around us. Um, we might talk about new chapters when we think about our lives. Um, and, and in some ways, it, it, doesn't take, it doesn't take much of a chain at all to change at all to kind of initiate what might feel like a, a new chapter in our life. Maybe the chapters are short, maybe it's not something major. But every change is an opportunity kind of for a new beginning or to recognize that okay, things are a little different now and we move into life in light of that change. Sometimes new beginnings are of our own choosing. A new job a new house. Maybe, maybe those were choices we made and we entered into that and, and there's lots of excitement and, and we feel real good. We, we think this is something that's going to be better and we make changes and we anticipate and, and are excited about those new beginnings. I think of a couple people even here this morning. Well, a couple. A couple is two. So two couples here this morning at least where, where one of them, I assume it was, it was the guy, but I, I never inquired real closely. One of them said, will you marry me? And the other one said yes. And uh, in both cases, one of them is just around the corner and uh, the other one just a couple months away. So, uh, well, no, it's next month. <laughs> David said, oh man, <laughs> it was easy for October to seem a long time away. And now all of a sudden we're in September and it's next month, David. So, <laughs> all right. Um, the other ones, in case you didn't connect, yeah, I'm, I'm looking back at, at, at Lance back there is the other one who I, I uh, suppose is the one who asked Sarah to marry him. And uh, <laughs> it does happen the other way around sometimes, and that's, that's okay too. But talk about new beginnings, and we can certainly get caught up in the excitement of, of a wedding and of a marriage, of that new beginning in the life of, of two individuals. Uh, that's, that's one kind of new beginning that we understand clearly. But, but more often in life, those new beginnings, those changes are kind of forced upon us. You know, sometimes even the new job isn't something that we initiated. It's because another job was taken away for whatever reason and we have to find something else. It's not always a step forward from our perspective. Even a new house is not always what we would have chosen. Sometimes the new beginnings that are forced upon us are, are adjusting to someone else's new beginning. Think about that for a moment. Okay, th think of just going to school. Maybe it's, maybe it's your first child going to school for the first time. That's a new beginning for the child, right? It's exciting, but don't think that's not a new beginning, not an adjustment for mom and dad at home. Of course it is. Or the first child going to college. Or your youngest child going to school for the first time. Or your youngest child going to college. Or, I mean, you, you understand someone else's new beginning it can also be a new beginning for you. And not in a way that you're excited about. A way that means change for you too. And, and may have a sense of loss to it sometimes. And we find ourselves adjusting with that new chapter. A child getting married even with all the excitement around that, and that's what we want for our children, but I don't want to make anybody start crying here already, but <laughs> looking at Rick and Debbie, you know, there's, you've been through it once now. You, you know that there's, there's an adjustment, there's a change. Exciting, yes, but th there's a new chapter for, for others too who are part of that. New neighbors. It's someone else's new beginning. Someone moved away and someone else moved in. 
It had nothing to do with your choice, but now that's a new chapter in your life in terms of, of, of maybe that relationship. You see, there's so many ways that, that new beginnings are, are things that aren't necessarily our, our choices. There are things that happen to us. Adjusting to someone's departure in some setting, someone we are close to may move away or someone we're close to may make changes that remove them from our, from our frequent fellowship. And, and that brings about a change in, in our life in, in some way. Certainly adjusting to to a death. We heard about a tragic death this morning within our community and whether it's a tragic death at, at just such a young age, 22 years of age, or whether it's after a long life and it seems natural, it's still, it still is a new chapter. It still a, requires a new beginning as things change in our circle, in our family, in our, in, in our setting, something changes. We need to adjust to that. And we know that sometimes those changes are harder for the ones that we might say are left behind. A child going off to college, there's all kinds of excitement. And, you know, mom and dad may be, you know, really struggling with this. And the child's like, wow, this is what, you know, I'm, I'm going into the world. I'm, I'm finding my way. And there's all this excitement. And mom and dad are kind of trying to figure out what life's going to be like after this. I know, I know there are stories of times when there's a big party going on. Finally, you know, we've got... But you understand what I'm talking about. New beginnings are part of our life. Whether they're chosen or whether they're chosen for us. And, and I, guess, I guess just on my heart this morning is, is certainly thinking very broadly. We're talking about all kinds of areas of life. Family life, it's church life too. I mean, we, we experience it too. I don't just mean the cycle, but I mean change. You, you stay in a church long enough, and you'll, you'll experience the loss of fellowship through death. People you got very close to, people who are like family. We experience that here. We experience other people's new beginnings, departing for whatever reason and, and finding a new beginning for, for whatever reason someplace else. And, and we struggle with that, kind of like a parent. We're the ones left. And so I want us to look, look at just for a few minutes some, I'm going to say some practical and some biblical principles in terms of dealing with, with new beginnings whether it's something we're excited about, whether it's something that, that has happened in our world what, around us where we didn't really have a choice. And, and just as we, we think about these kinds of things, um, I want us to think both in terms of how we respond to new beginnings and also how we, how we view them. I mean, sometimes, sometimes we have a wrong idea that, that a new beginning is going to solve everything. So, so I'm, I'm talking, you understand here, this is a really big umbrella that I'm trying to pull us under for a few moments this morning. And how each one of you relates to it might be entirely different than, than someone else near you this morning. This isn't necessarily in a, in a um, completely logical order, but just, just some things I, I want to throw out there this morning. Um, you know, we've talked about the other people making choices and other people's new beginnings and how that impacts us. And, and so I guess the, the first thing I want to say is, is, first of all, be careful how you judge someone else's new beginnings. Okay, does that make sense? So sometimes we don't know what all is going on in another person's life. We don't know all their, their reasons. Um, be careful in doing that. And I, and I want to say that first because I'm going to talk about how we approach decisions about new beginnings, okay? So first of all, this is, not, this is not to judge other people and their decisions. But the second right, right behind that is be careful in pursuing your own new beginnings. So you understand why I said don't judge others in theirs. But I'm saying you be careful how you choose your own new beginnings where you do have a choice. 
Pursuing new beginnings in order to find happiness or in order to simply eliminate things that don't seem to be working in your life. And when, when those types of things are the primary motivations, we can often be led out of the frying pan into the fire. We can, we can often fall victim to the myth of the greener grass. Do you know why the grass is often greener on the other side of the fence? <laughs> That's where the septic system is. I mean, we chuckle, but sometimes things are not always as they seem. And when we just think of, of those opportunities we have to make changes, I mean, the scripture says a lot about new things and new beginnings, and we're going to get there, and we're going to get there very soon. But, but it's important that we recognize that pursuing new beginnings in order to find happiness will never ultimately satisfy. If we're just chasing something, chasing that elusive carrot, the scripture gives so many examples. Uh, Jesus told about, told about the rich fool who was accumulating things, and, and he, he made a new beginning in his life. Let's build a new barn so I can have more room for all these things that I'm accumulating. That's, that's not a healthy kind of new beginning. To say, okay, that's going to make me happier. To have a bigger barn for more things. And however that relates to us, if there's a part of us that, that thinks that that's the answer to us, that's the answer to our current discontent or whatever it might be, that's, that's a dangerous path to go down. I think of what Paul wrote to young Timothy in, in his first letter that talks particularly about pursuing wealth and material things. I mean, it's... That's not to say that, that moving from one job to another job can't be a positive thing. If, if we're just doing it just to, to climb a ladder and just to make more money and we're pursuing that, that, that can be a dangerous guide for, for thinking that that's going to that's gonna be the answer to our life. Paul in Timothy, 1 Timothy 6 encourages young Timothy to to have as a foundation in his life contentment and God-centeredness. He says in chapter 6, verse 6, but godliness with contentment. Godliness, I'd describe it as God-centeredness. God-centeredness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Jesus said, what shall it benefit a person to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? This is just a reminder of be careful what we're chasing, be careful what we're pursuing in life. Be careful of the motivation that might lead us to think that that one particular form of new beginning is going gonna, is gonna to solve all of our problems. Instead, as Paul said to Timothy, a God-centered life with contentment. And then right after this passage, he said, but you, man of God, don't chase after material things, but you, man of God, flee from all of this, and instead, here's what you should pursue. Pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, a God-centered life, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue endurance, pursue gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. These are the things, he says, focus on that. Pursue new beginnings in order to love God more, in order to love your neighbor. And even then, seek God's guidance. Seek the counsel of other people who, whose lives are centered on God. Don't judge others' new beginnings, but be careful in pursuing your own. I'm going to make a sharp turn. Here's a very a very different application. I want to suggest that failure, failure is, is always a good opportunity for new beginnings. I'm talking about our own failures, our own, 
whether it be a failure in, in something we're just trying and, and messed up, a failure, a mistake at work, or whether it be what we call a moral failure, whether it be some, some place where we have, have, have fallen into a pattern or to sin in some way, where we have, have harmed other people, we've hurt other people, we've just really messed up in relationship, whatever. Failure is always a good opportunity for good or for a new beginning. Proverbs 24, 16, the familiar section of a verse that says, For though the righteous fall seven times, they, they rise again. And the pattern of scripture is that there is always grace to start again, to start again. That's the kind of new beginning we should pursue. Is, is where can I, like Paul said, where can I forget what's behind? And look ahead to what's in front of me and, and pursue God with all of my heart. Where, where can I find that new beginning in my life? To start over. To start over today in seeking God with all my heart. To start over today in, 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 in making things right where I've wronged someone, where I've hurt someone. To start over today in owning my failures. And in seeking grace to build on a new foundation. John said in his first letter that if we say we have no sin, we just deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sin, that God is faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us. And that cleansing is a, is a new beginning, isn't it? And of course, the ultimate new beginning is when we say yes to Jesus. Say yes to following him, yes to trusting him. It was Paul who wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone, has gone and new life has begun. And Paul knew what he was talking about, didn't he? Talk about a new beginning. Talk about someone who was going one direction and in a moment in time turned around and was going the opposite direction. That's a change. That's a new beginning. That's the kind of new beginning we need to pursue. Paul, who was persecuting the Christian church, thought he was doing God's work and persecuting the Christians, the followers of Christ. One day, God got his attention. And God convicted him, and he turned around the other way and became one of the greatest missionaries for Christ that has ever lived. That's the kind of new beginning that God desires and that God blesses certainly and then there's coming back to those things again that are outside of our control the challenge is to accept these new beginnings outside of our control with a confidence that God is still God the confidence that God God was at this point in the road before we ever got there. That God was there before this change ever occurred, whatever it is in our life. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurs to God? You have to think about that one for a moment. Something occurs, meaning, oh, I just thought of that and I hadn't thought of it before. There's nowhere we can go. I don't mean just geographically. I don't mean just physically. There's nowhere we can go in our journey in time that God is not there ahead of us. Accept new beginnings that are outside of your control with confidence in the faithfulness of God. Confidence in his love and mercy. You see, this, this theme is not just about a new year, is it? See, each week, each week as we gather is kind of like an opportunity for a new beginning, isn't it? I think that's part of what God designed into the, into the Sabbath cycle. Six days you labor, but on the seventh day you should rest. I think God knows we need to recharge, we need to refocus. And that as we do that, as we rest, as we worship as we let ourselves be recharged, it's a chance for a new beginning, a new chapter, a new week. 
but it gets even smaller than that. Each day, that same cycle, you, you ever notice? <laughs> I know sometimes it feels like, yes, I'm only getting an hour of sleep for every seven hours awake. Well, no, God's a little more generous than that in most cases, though I know some really struggle with sleeping at night, and that can be a real problem. But the scripture that we read in our, in our scripture focus earlier, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And I know sometimes the night goes on goes on for years and years for some people and their circumstances. I know for the, those in Houston and, and the Southeast Texas and those in Southeast Asia, I know, I know these types of things. For a family who has lost a, a young daughter, I, I know these types of things. The nighttime can go on for a long time. I understand that. But I also understand that, that God created a cycle of sleep. And, and maybe not everything bad will go away, but but even day by day, a new day, there's a new chance to then live that out, to, to be re-energized, re to be rested, to be able to now tackle sometimes new problems, sometimes the same struggles all over again, but for another day, and we wake up with a little bit refreshed. But perhaps the most powerful scripture for me in that regard is the one that Lamont led us in looking at last week. Scripture that's one of my favorites that gives the lyrics to perhaps my absolute favorite of all hymns. We read it together this morning from, of all books, the book of Lamentations. You don't even have to know the history of who wrote it. It's Jeremiah. He was called the weeping prophet. <laughs> Jeremiah lived under a lot, of, a lot of stuff that was going on in his country and invasions and deportations and all of that type of thing. But just know that in the book of Lamentations, which means to lament, to cry, to weep, to wail in the midst of a book called Weeping, a book called Tears, is this reminder. Because of the Lord's great love, that we are not consumed. You know, I used to read that as meaning, okay, well, if God wasn't a God of love, he'd be a God of anger, and, and he would destroy us. I, I'm not sure that's what it means. Life can consume us. But it's because of the Lord's great love. That whatever's happening out there around us, whatever changes come that, that were not of our choosing, whatever new beginnings we are forced to make in life, we don't have to be consumed by them. Whatever a new day might bring for us, we don't have to despair. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. His mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God's mercy, the source of his forgiveness. God's mercy from his heart of compassion. Those mercies never run out. They're new every morning for whatever we must face. Great is his faithfulness. So wherever you're standing under this big umbrella of new beginnings, may you stand there with confidence in the faithfulness of God that whatever's ahead in this next chapter, that he will walk with us through it, through the pain, through the pleasure, and we can trust in him.